Well, hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the first uh, in-person meeting besides Saber Day. The first in-person meeting of 2024. That's right. That's right. Remember last month we were all hybrid because we thought we were going to get frozen in. Right. Yeah. But uh, um, welcome. Welcome back, everyone. Um, all right. So uh, I'm Joe Thompson, just in case y'all don't know who I am. Uh, Mike's not here to correct me. Mike's <laughs> from Dallas, so please tell him that I introduced myself. <laughs> all right. So believe it or not, everyone, we have quite a few guests and new members. Uh, I guess that uh, uh, Saber Day and Astros Fun Fest thing kind of worked because I count that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine new members from last month. Uh, uh, right. And at least one of them is here. Uh, yeah. Hey. Uh, uh, representative. <laughs> Max Bush from Richardson. Jonathan Goodwin from Katie, right there. And I'm going to throw this name. I'm just going to say it. Xing Kui Wang from Houston. And I apologize for destroying your name. <laughs> um, Chris, Christian Kruger from Fullshire. Connor Kirkon from Houston. Jacob Lapp from Houston. Uh, Diego Martinez from Houston. Pat Sparks from Katy. And Tyler Suarez from Magnolia. So whatever y'all are doing out there, keep it going. All right? Uh, we are growing and growing. Today we have uh, three guests, uh, four guests uh, in attendance. Um, hopefully you will sign up or run for the hills <laughs> at the end of the meeting. Uh, two guests are uh, here courtesy of Phil Boudreaux, our speaker tonight. We have Tim Bird from Huntsville. Tell me he's out on bond. <laughs> uh, that, that, that's what he said. <laughs> he said that. I did. <laughs> All right. And uh, Tony Wallace from the Woodlands. Okay. We have a very special guest with uh, Patrick. Jill. Jill Guilford. You don't know Jill. She uh, we met her at uh, Fanfest, and she's here by way of Indiana, close to Purdue. But she stayed with Patrick now, so I guess uh, they like each other. <laughs> Great job, Patrick. Great job. <laughs> I got a mess. <laughs> and then we have a guest, the Marsha, Greg Bergeron. Greg, where are you from? Houston. Houston? Okay. All right. I decided for now. Well, what part of Houston? What's the Klein Forest High School? So you're up at Greenwood Forest. Okay. All right. It's fine. All right. Good. Good. Um, good. Well, welcome, everybody. Welcome, those of you online. Vince, nice to see you again, Vince. All right. Uh, Sam, nice to see you again. Or Samuel, right? I can't remember if I just Yeah. Okay. Good. Right. Corrected me last. <laughs> all right. Um, a little disappointing news. Uh, and I know all of us are upset. With 284 votes from the Baseball Writers Association of America, <laughs> Wagner finished his ninth year on the ballot with 73.8% of the tally. Is he going to get in next year? This is it next year, right? Number 10. Uh, I don't know what the deal is. Brownies, do you know? I have one piece of information, and only that. I'm sure most of you already know this, but uh, according to what I heard, three people did not vote for Billy Wagner this year, voted for him last year, <laughs> and they had open spots on their ballots when they found him in this year. How do you justify that? I don't get it either. I don't know what's going on. So, well, Billy, if you can hear us, we hope you get in next year. <laughs> we'll be rooting for you. All right, last month we had Jay Barrell. It was a busy month last month. We had Jay Barrell, uh, the Vice President of Astros Business Strategy with us uh, for the meeting. 
for the all uh, Zoom meeting. Uh, he gave us a lot of good information. Um, and uh, he gave us, uh, uh, those of you who were online last month for the meeting, uh, you, were, you were privileged. Okay, as Lou was telling me, be quiet. Okay, you were privileged, all right? Uh, Jay made sure to tell me. All right, so if you missed it last month, sorry. <laughs> um, all right, uh, we also had Carlos Robinson to talk about the book, The Right Side of History. Um, just keep that, that book title in mind. Uh, you may see that book uh, again tonight, okay? Uh, it was a great story about her dad, the life and career of Johnny Wright, co-pioneer in Breaking Baseball's Color Barrier, as told by his dog. All right, there you go. That book right there, okay? <laughs> All right. Uh, Fan Fest, January 20th. We had a lot of interest. We gave out a lot of baseball cards. Uh, thank you all for volunteering and coming out and uh, supporting the chapter. Uh, Carter Pena, young kid, won the Larry Durker signed baseball. So wherever you are, Carter, congratulations. Uh, he said one day he's going to come to a meeting, so I told him I'm going to hold him to that. So it's a young kid. All right. Uh, we sold a lot of, we sold quite a few books um, in between the Houston baseball book and my Mexican American baseball books. And that does very well for the chapter. Okay. Uh, we sold quite a few. Um, Saber Day. Um, quite a few of you in here went to Saber Day, February 10th. Brian McTaggart talked to us for about 30, 40 minutes, and then he took questions for about 30 or 40 minutes. Um, if you haven't seen the video, it's on the YouTube channel. Uh, he, he has a lot of great information, uh, a lot of good stuff. Um, plus, we uh, shared some stories of memorabilia. And um, again, the video is on the YouTube channel. So uh, he told us a lot of great stuff about uh, spring training. He's down there right now uh, in the club. Um, the thing I remember the most is that Jake Myers is starting in center field. Okay, I think uh, Joe Espada kind of confirmed that today. Yeah. All right, Jake Myers is uh, starting in center field, and as Brian said, they're going to see if he can actually do it this year. Okay, and then uh, Chaz is going to platoon with Jake Myers and Jordan in center and left. I think that's how they're going to work that. So I'll be cheering for Chaz because I got the jersey. <laughs> I love Chaz. <laughs> so, um. Very quickly, in case you don't know, early registration for Saber 52 is now available. Okay, I'm registered already. Uh, Maxwell, who's not with us, he's also registered. Uh, it's going to be in Minneapolis, uh, August 7th through the 11th uh, at the higher Regency. Uh, people like Rod Carew, Tony Oliva, Bert Blylevin, Jim Cat are all scheduled to be there. All right, so if you want to hear them talk, Hi, right, sign up for it. Uh, it's a little bit different this year uh, as far as the pricing. Bob, I don't know if you signed up for it already, did you? Yeah, it's a little bit different here, but uh, Sabre members is $265 for the early rate for June 7th, $295 after the regular rate, uh, non-members $335. Uh, Sabre 52 attendees have the option of purchasing tickets for the following optional events. In years past, you buy the all-inclusive, and that included a game ticket. Not this year. Okay, um, it's it's a little different. Um, there's some optional events, which I'm, I I purchased a uh, ticket for the St. Paul Saints game. You can go on Thursday, August the 8th. Uh, they're playing the Columbus Clippers. Um, it, uh, the game this game ticket includes round trip bus transportation from the higher agency. Um, if you don't want to do that, that same day, they hit, they're offering a Target Field ballpark tour. Okay, if you don't want to go to the minor league game. Um, the ticket to the St. Paul Saints game is 30 bucks. The Target Field Ballpark Tour is $20. Um, Friday, August the 9th, you could buy a ticket for the Twins versus the Guardians. Um, Sabres reserved a block of tickets in the Diamond Box and the Field Box level in the left field corner, $42. So you have to buy those optionally. Okay, that's optional buying. I'm sure they're going to add extra stuff. And Sabre has a special group rate at the Hyatt for two nineteen a night. Okay, um, it's usually pretty reasonable. Go ahead, Herb. Uh, I saw that price, so I started looking for other hotels nearby. 
Now there's a double tree that is offered to have the 155 with the stop and I'm still by the block or Yes, if you want some cheaper than you find it. Yeah, if you want something, yeah, that's right. Yeah. You didn't check out the hill, did you? Yeah. Well, it's all that hill. Well, I mean, the uh, isn't there another hill close to it? Uh, I never seen that, but they might be. Okay. All right. Um, so after you register for Saber 52, you'll see the email confirmation. Okay. Um, there's other upcoming conventions. I was hoping Matthew would be here. So he'd like to talk about the uh, a couple other conventions. This Gloria, are you going to a convention besides the national convention this year? You know, I wanted to go to the Jerry Malloy convention in June, but it's in Cooperstown. And when Lucia and I went for uh, Bagwell, uh, God, we wound up staying for 30 quite a ways away from Cooperstown. So I don't know. You don't know. Okay. I hope so. All right. Yeah. Um, but you went for the Hall of Fame thing. It's a little bit different. Right. Yeah, yeah, you might be able to get a good room. Um, okay. Uh I'm, open registration yet, so I don't know. Okay. But I think they like, said people should make their own reservations. Okay. Okay. Uh I have an announcement for next month. Uh in case you don't know, uh I, for the last eight, ten months, which explain why I don't have even more hairs that I haven't had in the past. <laughs> Um, I'm leading a faculty-led learning abroad program uh, to Athens, Greece. Okay? And uh, I'm going to be gone through spring break. I'm leaving the 7th, and I'm coming back to 17th. Um, I, when I come back, I have to spend the night in Amsterdam. So for me, right? <laughs> for me. <laughs> so when I come back to 17th, you know, I might not be fully into it. Uh, but our our meeting is the next day, okay? Our meeting is March the 18th, and Bob has agreed, Bob Durrell has agreed to run the meeting for next month. Uh, huh? Bob knows a little bit about it. Yeah, Bob knows. Yeah, yeah. Bob, Bob, I'm sure Bob knows how to run a meeting. Um, Matthew, uh, uh, Regiment, I always destroy the name. Matthew will talk about the Houston race riot of 1917 and Negro League baseball player Roy Tyler. Okay. Um, plus, Mike McCroskey and I are trying to schedule a very special guest. And if we uh, to speak with us, and you do not want to miss this special guest. That's all I'm going to say. All right. I've been told to hush hush. I'm not a good lips. A few people in this room know who it is, but uh, it's a very special guest. You don't want to miss it. Okay. Uh, next, next month, March the 18th. March 18th. Right, whatever that Monday is, March 18th. Okay. Um, also, <laughs> are they right? Yeah. Exactly. I'm going to come here. I'm going to kneel like Nolan Ryan did. This <laughs> month. <laughs> Didn't think I remembered that. Bitch. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Monday, April the 22nd. Now, once the baseball season starts, April and May, there's a problem with the third Monday of each uh, of both of those months. Okay, so Monday, April the 22nd, the fourth Monday, Mike Vance, our old buddy, is going to be talking to us. All right, uh, we can't have a meeting April the 15th because it's Astros home game against the Braves. And it's Jackie Robbins Day. Okay? So uh, Monday, April 22nd, Mike Vance is going to be here to talk about his uh, new book and to sign some copies. All right? I hear it's, uh, he's going to the fiction route. I, I think. Um, in May, Astros are playing the Angels Monday, May the 20th. So, starter's day, May the 23rd, our old buddy David Jerome is making a special trip to Houston. He will be here and he will talk to us about his Bill Verdon book. Okay? And he will sign copies. And it's Thursday, Thursday, May the 23rd. And those of you who love steak, I talked to the owner of the restaurant. That is steak night. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big crowd. Thursday, May the 23rd. You get a steak and a potato for 20 bucks. 
party hard on steak. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the owner told me that's steak night, so get here early. All right, for the parking lot, just get here early. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Eating time. Yeah, Thursday, May 23rd. Um also uh I uh talked last time we met together. Uh I asked how many of y'all would like to go to Corpus Christi for a game? Uh so can I get some uh, hands? Do y'all still want to go to Corpus Christi for a game? Okay, well I got an email today from uh the hooks. Okay, August 30th. The hooks are playing the Tulsa drillers. You know any y'all know who the drillers are associated with? Dodgers. The Dodgers. <laughs> okay. Um, he has told me, and I quote, since you do have an interest in our sweet seats, we have packages that come with 12, 25, or 37 plus people, which for August 30th, it would be priced at 68 bucks, including dinner. Wow. Wow. So uh, that's August 30th, the Saturday. I think it's the evening. Yeah. It's Labor Day weekend. It's August the 30th. So those of you who want to go, talk to Mike, Bob, and I. We're going to set this up. And uh, we can go to, uh, as a chapter, I'm going to talk to Gilbert in Round Rock, uh, the Bill Gilbert chapter. We have a big contingent of Astros fans maybe going down to see the Hooks versus the Drillers August the 20th. August 30th. Corpus Christi. I know we usually go to Sugar Land, but uh, this year we ought to do something special. Go to Corpus, all right? And you just go for the game and do whatever you want the rest of the weekend, okay? Uh, we're going to try to set somebody up from the hooks to come talk to us, okay, as well. So, um, all right. The Astros win contest, that's coming up around again. It will be happening next month. Um, I'm going to send the details out in early March. And speaking of the win contest, our winner from last year is Bill Browning is here. And I have tried for I don't know how long to give you this gift for winning the contest from last year. Thank you. So, Browning, here's our winner from last year. And, uh, and it kind of goes with uh, what you've done the last two years or so. So, uh, if you don't mind. I, you, whatever. I thought it would be special considering what you've done. Try to pull it out. Here. Uh, I got this at the Field of Dreams in Iowa. And Bill has written some, written some books the last uh, couple of years, mm -hmm. and I think it goes well. If you build it, it will come. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No problem, no problems. So, Bill's in the mail. Joe, is this the game to guess how many wins the Astros are going to have? Right. Okay. So, if start thinking about how many wins you think the Astros are going to have this year. Um, and uh, when the details are released, we'll have a tiebreaker. Uh, last year, it was home runs by Jordan and stolen bases by Tucker. This year, it might be something different. Uh, but when I release it, make sure you send the email to uh, Herb. I'll, I'll send out the information. Just send it to him before opening day, which is what, March 30th? Yep. Tiebreaker could be uh, Verlander's days on the IL. Tiebreaker could be <laughs> Verlander's days on the IL. March 28th? Okay. Yeah, okay. So, uh, just sort of keep that in mind. Start thinking about how many wins you think the Astros are going to have this year. Um, next chapter newsletter, Tony and Scott. Um, we're talking about opening day, right? Opening day. End of April. End of April. End of April. End of April now. Okay. So, um, if you have some articles, please share your thoughts. Tony, you have some ideas of what some articles can be? Um, well, I certainly. Preview of the season. Preview of the season. And I can't remember if he, uh, memory of Larry Ziggs. I don't or not he had them. So we might make space to do that. Go get a point of the higher. Um, also, I was thinking about this 100 
we, we had some film footage here the night before we pulled Wall Street. We need to go. Got film footage for that. And the jobs. Perfect. And uh, quite something about the 1924 series. That's a funny proceeding. Uh, statistical name of the end, you know, that at the year that Parker Falls be getting 422. Mm -hmm. Which is the highest average in the modern students in history for 24. In 24? And it's 1856. And uh, it happens a lot. It's so, excuse me. Also, have a year that uh, Gershwin's one's uh, rapid ingredients. Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. okay. Cool. All right. It's, uh, cool. It's the president. We'll go to the president. <laughs> you got some ideas, right? Please, anyone. That's all I got. I, I asked you. I said, "Was it a good game? You were there." Yeah. Yes. Please drink your Rolling Stones concert. Let's ever get some more. That's I. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. Same after the meeting. Let's show you. Let's show you the wooden bat. That bat is so safe. Bat bat. Yeah, that's it. All right, without further ado, uh, let's bring on our special guest, Phil Boudreaux. He's a staple of Astros baseball, baseball for 40 years. Wow. And in 2023, he was voted in as an inductee into the Houston Baseball Media Wall of Honor. Uh, the Astros will recognize Boudreaux at Minute Maid Park in a pregame ceremony on April the 16th, 2024. Day after Jackie Robinson's day. Nearly every Astros home game in 40 seasons, Futro has assisted Astros broadcasters like Bill Brown. Okay? <laughs> He's worked over 3,000 Astros games, various television broadcasters over the years, also collaborated with uh, Brownie and Acosta on the 2021's look, Houston Astros Golden Era which traced the team's history. In addition to joining the telecast in 1982, Boudreaux also served as sports producer and reporter for KTRH Radio from 82 to 89, producing the award-winning sports beat show with Jerry Truppiano and John Green. Ladies wow. and gentlemen, Bill Boudreaux. Thank you. Thank you Press the down button. Oh, Scotch or something. All right. Um, it, first of all, Brownie and I work with over 2,000 games together. Um, it's amazing when you're working with someone and you're on the same wavelength with each other. And, uh, you know, you are the rare people who you would have a thought, you'd be going someplace, and I could help finish your sentence. And, and you know, we sat next to each other. And it's, it's amazing when you see the ball game a different way. Uh, and just have that that feel for it, but no other people to work with. Mm -hmm. so, okay. um, the the whole thing I'm, I'm going to talk about tonight kind of gets into the business of baseball, which is what we're kind of it's the background of all this. But um, broadcasting kind of started, you know, obviously over a hundred years ago. Like we was talking about, the first games um, on on the radio were in 1921. KDKA, the Pittsburgh Pirates, um, televised or, or broadcast it. Television came into play, obviously, shortly more after World War II. Um, but it's always been about the, some of the finance, big markets and small markets. I found this quote, um, and I, I want to see what, what you guys think about this. It was a talk about how it was going to destroy baseball, the moving of a, of a team from the, from us. Medium-sized market to a big market was really going to screw up everything. You know when that was first said? 1953. Mike uh, Luke Perini, I believe is how he pronounced his name, moved the Boston Braves only to 200,000 people and were outdrawn by the Red Sox by 600,000 fans that year and moved to the big market of Milwaukee. Not exactly what we think of as the, the, the piece of that that goes with it. So. Just because there's a, a change in business doesn't necessarily mean that. The economics of baseball have changed. When we from baseball in the pre-expansion era, five of the markets, I believe, um, were shared markets. Uh, Chicago, St. Louis, 
uh, Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, and uh, and Boston. And uh, Philadelphia, so Philadelphia. So you had all these markets which were shared. The only place that really worked and stayed the same way was in Chicago. Everybody else had some movement and some franchise movements at some point in time. So all of that kind of felt into the background of what happens in broadcasting because you have the whole market to yourself or just part of the market to yourself. Um, in, in most of the stations that ended up um, around the country, baseball was fortunate to be on 50,000 watt stations in, in, in large part. Uh, initially, when the Astros won the air, they were on, on KTR, or KPRC radio, 950. Um, my, my, my background in radio is um, I always wanted to work on, at KPRC because that was the Astro station. When I was growing up, that was something I really wanted to do. That never happened. Um, I ended up getting a chance to go to, to work at KTRH radio right out of college. And from there, we kind of saw like, two years into it, they were able to get the Astro broadcasting rights. And they held those for years. And now everybody's on basically only sports stations. Um, when I first started in radio, there were two sports talk shows in youth. They were on three hours a night. Right now, there are four all sports radio stations, and some of them actually talk about sports sometimes, but not too much. <laughs> so, so there are more generations of what happens. So I kind of preface this talk by saying this is the regional sports business 3.0, because it's been kind of generations that happen with this. That model on the bottom of there is 14 spinners. That is about the um. Uh, that initially was the broadcasting network that was in Washington, D.C. It ended up being, after it morphed into a couple other things, HTS became the sales arm of most of the regional sports networks. And what they were able to do against the broadcast networks is, if you were a broadcaster, you didn't go to each individual team and cut your deal. You went to HTS and you got everybody and everybody spent money out of it. So that actually helped energize the regional sports business. So, so you know, that's just some, that's some thought of how we, we got here. Uh, so let's kind of go through a little more of that. First down. Yeah, yeah, sure it goes. Before cable existed, we had games on TV. You used to get one game a week. Um, Tony Kubek and Kirk Alley, and this Kirk Alley, Al Dergonis. And the guy who I loved with all this was the guy, statistician Mark Vaughn. That's who I want to be where I'm going. It's far wrong. <laughs> and it kind of happened that way. So I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, but you had a game of the week. But the Astros in the late 60s started televising a single game. Uh, initially, it was on channel uh, 13 here in, in Houston. Uh, but one of the real problems on doing the road games for this was you had to go relay station to relay station to get a broadcast signal from one place to another. Um, any of you guys that are, we live up north and um, up towards uh, the woodways. So there's a big tower over there where, where the woodways used to be. That's a mic work tower. What they used to do is transmit the light gate back from tower to tower to tower, and you had to detail all this above the stone. So, and if one tower had a problem, you didn't get a signal. Remember that, that, that cartoon thing where the, where the guy pulled out the plug? That literally was happening, and you had to call each station until you found that word going backwards where it went out at. So, you know, so one game a one game a week was a lot. In the late nineteen mid nineteen sixties, um, the first broadcast satellites were launched. Um, they called West Star. Uh, I ended up spending a lot of my life in the uh, logistics part of, uh, of broadcasting, and so we put a lot of things up on satellites. Now there are plenty of satellites. Back then, there were not. They were very hard to get to. So a uh, company called Western Union, that we still have heard of, um, was the person who took it off of satellite and then would send it down to these microwave caps to the individual stations who get it. And the Astros were huge because the Astros, before the Rangers got here, held the entire Texas market, held Louisiana, and a couple uh, of stations up in Arkansas. Everybody who didn't get St. Louis in this area was getting the Astros. So the Astros actually worked pretty hard to make sure and keep baseball out of Arlington for as long as they could. <laughs> they ended up working that way, but, but that was really what they were trying to do. 
So you have a dementia game of the week on, on uh, Saturday afternoon. And I remember growing up, I saw, saw a lot of Baltimore Orioles, a lot of Frank Robinson and Dewey Powell and Brooks Robinson, a lot of Minnesota Twins. Uh, the National League was one of our best at that point in time. There were a lot of decent teams, but there really wasn't an outstanding team at the level that, that those teams were at. And all of a sudden, Miracle Mets came on, and, and we had this. But the only thing that the broadcasters had on a national basis was this one game a week and the um, and the Bull Series. And the Bull Series was a high profile item. It was only played in the afternoon, but you couldn't get ratings. So, you know, that, that was a that's a problem. So Home Sports Entertainment was the local entry into this. That was the company I went to work for. And this year, Channel 20 televised, took the games away from Channel 13. It was a UH uh, station. And they, I believe they also spent a little bit of time on 26, if my memory serves me correctly, before they became a uh, Metro Media station. So they started televising the games on the road. And they kept picking up more games on the road because there wasn't any real loss for the local people to having it on TV. Um, so the, the regular radio announcers would usually go over to, <laughs> the, um, to do the games and it actually brought in usually, usually an extra person um, who would kind of get put into the mix uh, at, the, at the team level. Um, I believe that's actually how kind of Dirk went from the ticket office to go work for the Astros was because they were looking for somebody else to kind of be involved with that. I don't know, I don't know the story of that, but I think the timing sinks up pretty well after he left St. Louis. So, um, <clears throat> cable TV really began go working in the late 1970s. And the appeal of cable TV was very much into major metropolitan areas, which are major in the baseball markets, right? Um, the reason being is if you live in Manhattan, you have cable as opposed to having television because your signal on television would have ghosts on it because you would get the reflection of the signal off of other adjacent buildings to you. And therefore, you look like you're seeing two or three different images, just a little bit in the background there, but didn't make for a good signal. Cable gave you a much cleaner signal. It cost money, it was for free. But many people thought that. And we thought we had 30 channels of cable TV. We just had we were walking in high point at that point. <laughs> so the the Astros kept picking up more games, uh, and, and Channel 20 picked up those games, and we had um then HSE came to the Astros and uh, Dr. McCollum and asked to televise the games at home. And there was a great deal of controversy across all the teams about having games on TV. Uh, and the home games, because they're afraid they're going to hurt the gate. And the majority of the money that came from, from TV was for the, from the gate. That has slowly changed. And as we see now, um, when we were doing a studio things during the COVID year, they started the games on the West Coast. Um, when the Astros played Oakland, uh, here, we, played, we started the game at 8 o'clock at night, not 7 o'clock at night, because it was purely a, a studio sport at that point in time for that season. So a little bit of the pushback of the direction about where we were going and how we were to get there. Um, and, and the other thing that was kind of funny, and this kind of speaks to, to Dirk as well, most teams had multiple play-by-play -play announcers, um, three, two or three play-by-play -play announcers, and no color announcers. At that point in time, there were very few people who actually did that. You, you, you had some... There's some of them, but, but here in this market, part uh, Durker was the first player to ever be on the air. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, built, I'm out. Um, as a matter of fact, when we started doing Astros games on HSE, uh, Larry's or Joe Sanvito had thrown out his elbow here, was on the disabled list, and actually televised um, or, or broadcast snares uh, with Jim Durham, who um, was the Bulls announcer for for many many years. Um, uh, he's a Houston guy, was a Houston guy as well, I passed away. Um, but it's kind of changed the way the broadcast was done. And so there are more ways to do this. So that's kind of how it started. So how much was it going to hurt attendance? That was the, that was the burning question that everybody wanted to know. And HSE became the provider for sports in Houston and Dallas. And what HSE was able to do was something rather unique. They were able to share the market because you knew we were only going to be able to televise home games here, home games that aren't like that. 
when there was no conflict, they let the other team, the game, go to the other market. Most teams have very <laughs> close territories and wouldn't allow this to happen. As, as a matter of fact, most of the original broadcast territories and the regional sports networks were set up over college conferences and what their territories were. Arkansas wanted to be in the St. Louis market, but because the Southwest Conference, when it was growing up, encompassed um, uh, the Southwest Conference encompassed Arkansas, they were in HSE territory. So when the St. Louis network began, they actually kept it on, it, it stayed here, and they wanted to move networks. As our technology got significantly better, we were able to switch people over and move the St. Louis market, or people who wanted to be in the northern part of that, which were the St. Louis, other parts were going to Dallas or to the Rangers, and the rest of most of the southern part of the state and, and Louisiana would come to here for the Astros games. Mostly going to the area where you're talking about, um, uh, there was also something called open territory. Um, Florida, until the Marlins got there, was considered open territory. Nobody had a, so any game could go into there. But I, I don't know if you remember, they used to have these big dishes you could have at your house. And you could you know, dial in that thing. Massive things, massive piece of technology, and they're now all um, bird dance, I think, more or less. Um, but you have that put a zip code in to where that thing is located at. Based on your zip code, depending on which team you could see. And we had a whole apartment back at our facility, which monitored nothing but the cable systems and the zip codes that they influenced, or they were, they were subject to. So, uh, let's see. And let's see, what do Things change. Does anybody know who this is, other than Brown? Okay. That is Jeff Hamilton. Uh, Dodgers, third baseman. Anybody that's significant to Jeff Hamilton? He was the losing pitcher in the 22 inning Astros Dodger game wow. in 1988, I think. Yeah. And that was the encompassing time where the regional sports network grew up. We lost most of the people watching the game because the network was on a timer. HSE was on a shared transponder or shared uh, channel space with the business news network. And there's no way anybody thought that you'd be airing anything after midnight, let alone two o'clock in the morning, except we were doing that together that night. Um, and Jeff Hamilton, a losing pitcher in the game, but that became the push to give them their own channel um, and their own entirety of a 24 hour network. Before that we had, they were essentially off at five o'clock at night, two o'clock in the morning. All the sports that were started. Um, MSG is one of the first ones to all mess with the way from that. That's the driving factor for, for the Houston game to be able to be heard at that point. Oh, how the Houston is the So you had to What happened for us is HSE began to uh, grow into something. The same people who owned us also got the rights to the Orlando Magic in Florida, became the Sunshine Network. And Prime Sports Network, which became in Denver, which at that point in time had the Nuggets. We, under that banner, added a lot of things to it. Um, Midwest, upper Midwest, a lot of different areas. Uh, baseball came slower than did uh, the NBA teams, because the NBA teams and NHL teams wanted to find homes immediately for where they were at. Most of the baseball teams are somewhat happy with what they had, um, but it was a fall before they all moved into to where we're at now. Right. Um, so what we did at, at Fine Sports at that point in time, combined everything for shoulder programming around the ball games. Um, so we could get 24 hours of programming on there. That meant you were seeing Southwest Conference football, Southwest Conference basketball. You were seeing um, uh, MSG boxing on Monday nights for the felt forum as well. And we, we were doing a bunch of things, but all the regional networks put together their local program. And so the rodeo stuff would go, would go national on the cable systems this way because it gave them filler programming to fill up the things. They weren't selling it, but at least they were able to get something on the air that was, was unique and maybe not hyper local, but you know, they were trying to find some way to, to get that college. So they also brought in. There are other groups at this point in time. Uh, Brownie knows the story at the KBL quite well, Pittsburgh. 
Um, the sports trailer group is based out of New York, more or less. Um, they also have a network in Florida. They have Ohio. Um, those all got bought into the Fox Sports family in the late 1990s, Rainbow Broadcasting. Um, Nesson is still a, <coughs> excuse me, a standalone up in there. And there is from Finlay Sports, and they also um, are into big into NASCAR stuff themselves. But they're standalone, still in that environment. Pass got worked into um, uh, Fox Sports Detroit, which became the first. Uh, the, I don't know the year. I don't remember the year. Um, Fox Sports Detroit signed the rights for the Pistons, the Tigers, and the Red Wings for 10 years, collectively for a billion dollars. Wow. Um, you know, but you might have to divide it up amongst all the teams and, you know, how many games and hours of programming you're going to just. This is what it became. So, Pass got more than that. Prime Ticket was the Los Angeles version of this. There's two stations. There's actually four regional sports stations now in Los Angeles. Uh, the Prime Ticket band is still there. And then there's HGS in the C area. There are plenty of other ones, but those are the, the major players in this. And then you had the same point in time in the, in the early 80s, you had the super stations coming up. Uh, GM, um, TBS, and uh, then the PIX, um, which was the predecessor of what is now the um, the Yes Network, the Yankees, which is the, the the mother of all these, is part of the regional sports sale in uh, two and a half years ago. Yes was valued or sold for right under five billion, um, and that was after the Yankees bought back part of themselves. So um, they sold it to Fox. Fox sold it to um, uh, to ESPN, ESPN, and we'll be for that. So um, that's for a second. We had um, the baseball network, the failed attempt to um, that very good idea. It's basically what we're doing now. It's 20 years later. We're having the same thing happen to us. But the baseball network was MLB's attempt to kind of bring everything in, into themselves, so that they would be able to, to control the pieces of it. Unfortunately, they did not get related to a strike and kill it. Um, so, you know, baseball without baseball games isn't a great. You know, labor news wants to you can watch the final book news. And, yeah, so um, that didn't last long, but it was kind of a, a neat predecessor. This on Wednesday nights back in the day, baseball network had the exclusive on Wednesday nights. So all the they did several cable games. And you worked some of those games too, didn't you? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, so. During, right after the baseball network went away, Fox came in and bought up the regional sports networks from Liberty Media. Um, the nice game. And they put them all under the prime sports uh, banner. I couldn't find the prime sports thing, but I found the, the Northwest from the time. But they had, they had, I think at that point in time, 12 teams, I think is what we have in the system. But a pretty good, pretty good crew of uh, teams throughout. So... But the, the bulk of all of this goes down to these, this piece right here. How the networks make money and how much money the teams want to make. In-game commercial content, by and large, a decent chunk of it is owned by the team's tip. They get their local sponsors into those games. Um, the shoulder programming, I don't know if you remember on um, Fox Sports seven, eight years ago. We would always immediately go to a newscast show or post-game show right after the game. We ended the game and, you know, they would go, and the final score is three to two. Now the post-game show starts now because that kept the ratings up for us to charge more for the post-game show. Because the post-game show goes like this. It's every minute that goes on the air, because the ratings go down on the post-game show. And that was the best show that the network had as far as being able to get money out of it. So they were trying to find a way to, to maximize that, that potential. And this part in the middle, the cable subscriber fees, um, I don't know where it is now. I, I had a pretty good idea of this. Back um, in the uh, late, when, when the Astros moved from, from Fox Sports <clears throat> to Comcast, back in 2013, I think, is that right? Um, we were, you were paying, or we were getting paid roughly five ninety five per uh, cable sub for each um, for each cable sub. We'll come back to the uh, each month. We'll come back to HSE. That was where they made the money. That's where the these two pieces right there. 
The top part, the NK commercial crowd, did not so much. But the team scout knew this. And what they really tried to do is, how did we get our hands? We got this. Uh, we don't care about that. How did we get some of this? And so what they wanted to do was get their, I mean, and right, it's a good business decision on their part. But what, at 595, and this is what they started, Comcast came in, and normally the rates increase over time. When, when initially when the HSC was on the air, you, they were paying maybe 75 cents a sub. And over the course of 20 or 15 years, they're able to work it up to the, to the rate of, of $6 a, a sub. Well, they came in initially with, with, with Comcast and said, I got a great idea. You pay five ninety five for it. I'm going to bargain here. It's $8. And you know, for some reason, the cable systems were really just you know, happy about that. And so they didn't buy it. And so that's the reason Comcast lasted a year to be able to, before they exited the market. Um, their programming looked very nice. Their studio was very good. And the vocal programming was, you know, I think, quite significantly better than some of the stuff we see. So they did all those things, but they couldn't find it because they couldn't get the cable system to pick it up. They couldn't get direct TV to pick it up because everyone was paying had to pay that number. And so if they come in at a little bit lower rate and build it up over time, but that wasn't the business model that, that uh, they were sold when they bought the team. You know, so for good, bad, or indifferent. I mean, and, and please take it. I was on the Fox side of this, not the Comcast side of this. So I probably have some some pieces for you know, this is my look at it from where I'm sitting at. But um, so, and this is when it all kind of changed. This is two dollar. Anybody know the significance of of a rod in the, in the cable TV business? Two hundred million dollars. Two hundred fifty million. Yeah. Um. Interesting part. The week before that, you know what happened? Fox Sports signed a deal with the Texas Rangers, a 10-year deal for $250 million. A-Rod cost them $2 million. Why wouldn't you spend that? You know, so they were trying to, to maximize their, their game, but he actually changed it, and the money went directly. You could see a direct earnings from one point to the other. So... Over the next course of the next decade or so, Major League Baseball's roughly 20 to 25% of their income okay. reports. So these are all these are guesstimates based on the best things I 20% of their income comes off of cookie price. Um 20, in 2009 or 2010, um, the Angels signed a deal with ESPN Regional and they tried to create their own network. They failed um, to be able to make it work financially. And they bailed on it. Um, Fox picked it up. And then, but in this deal, in the, the 20 year joint venture deal, the team also got part of the subscriber base. That was the big change that happened from all this. So the team was actually going to get revenue from both sides. That was key for them to be able to do that. So this is up on, this is fairly recent. Um, this shows you the number of people who have ESPN versus the number of people at Netflix. And what it shows is that there's less people willing to buy uh, sports than there than are to, to stream stuff. And streaming is the, the, excuse me, is the direction it's going into. And that number, I, I think, is probably about, it's probably lower to something even more. ESPN is paying a ton of money for very good broadcast rights, very good product. But in that same extent, they're also they're the, the most expensive piece on the on the uh, on the cable system. So you're paying, I think, for ESPN by itself, it's things like almost ten dollars a sub per month. So, um, and what's happened is that whole thing has splintered the TV market. This is not a hundred percent current, but it's pretty close to it. You have all these different streaming services that have different pieces of who's got what. Um, you know, and everybody is available some which way or the other, but that's the reason there's not a single one-stop shop to get any particular team or all the teams. If you're on the road and you're and if you're a San Diego fan, you can stream it on the road that you can get it. But in the, what they're concerned about is protecting the in-market games and maximizing the revenue there. Um so they're looking at how do they how do they accomplish that? So, um, so what this means right now for for baseball 
is there's a change. This is 3.3.0. This is where we're at right now. <laughs> Excuse me. So we're broadcasting coming out of Baltimore, but the um, from the Fox Regionals were sold to ESPN. Security and Exchange Commission would not allow ESPN to maintain that. They then had to sell it in a in a reasonable time frame. They bought, they valued the regional sports networks <coughs> off of Fox at uh what do you feel that sound right? It's like 20 21 billion. It was over. When they sold them, um, when they sold the first part of this, they were able to value it roughly at 14 billion. So but they created a whole separate company, Sinclair did, to keep it away from their broadcast stations. Sinclair had 160 broadcast stations throughout the country, um, mostly small markets, nothing, uh, you know, but a lot of affiliates of all the channels. They do a lot of cable or of uh, high school stuff and as well for sports, but they have a lot of different product that way. But Sinclair uh, buys it, and then the problem happens because Sinclair wanted to get into business so bad, unfortunately, they didn't necessarily have a version of business plans because they bought it at the height of the market and bought it as the number of eyeballs was going down. So what's going to happen now? We saw a couple of weeks ago, Amazon bought into, um, into Sequoia, uh, into uh, Marquee Media, and they're going to do the broadcast rights to what's this year? Uh, the five teams that are uh, currently um, on being streamed as part of the rights with um, uh, with Sinclair, the Royals, the Tigers, the Brewers, the Marlins, and the Braves. So their broadcast will continue to be uh, streamed in market and be able to be gotten through an, an Amazon thing. And it's only a one year deal with Amazon. So if this doesn't work and they can't show it to be worth it, and honestly, when you have teams like, uh, I mean, hopefully the Royals are in the right direction. Um, uh, the, the, this is not exactly a quiet group of teams they have. <laughs> so that's, that may be part of the biggest problem with that. So, um, so where is so baseball's going to have to figure out what to do? So what is that? There's another piece with Rob Manford over here that has going on, and people don't necessarily think about this. They own Major League Baseball, if they were able to create the vehicle for distribution, for all the teams. They will also probably be the person used to do it for the NHL and the NBA, which means in a roundabout way, they will have the ability to collect the rights fees to their competitors in the sports world, the amount of uh, 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 college stuff. So the NHL and the NBA rights, you only have 80 games in the NHL, you only have 80 games in the NBA. You don't have enough product to justify a lot of the, the, the big stuff you need. So. That's kind of where the future of this may end up being played out. I just see where the, the government could get involved with this if baseball really pushes it. I think they probably will to see what goes on with it. So you have the haves and the have nots. Juan Soto obviously got traded to the Yankees a couple, uh, couple of months ago. Um, what people kind of missed in that story is the Yankees also took Trent Grisham, who is down to a two-year, very bad contract, came up with a good year, and hasn't produced anything since. He's a leadoff hitter who's not hitting too hard. Doesn't exactly, you know, and, and can't hit for power. So he's not exactly what, ha what they want. So, you know, he helps the Yankees out, but they're also going to have to eat that salary. Or, you know, he's going to be the most expensive AAA player uh, I would yeah. think. Because, because he's, if they release him, that's fine, but he'll give away his contract. If they outright him, he keeps his contract and get paid, you know, whatever it is, twelve or fourteen million dollars at Triple A. So if he goes Triple A, that's what he's he's been making good money next year. So the other place, another place where money is going in all of this, and this is FanDuel. You look at the the relative growth of the amount of revenues in just the, you know this is like the old data. It's, it's doubling every almost doubling every year. Um, and from from my perspective, um, I I work do the NFL uh, the NFL statistician for Houston. The NFL is exceedingly interested in us getting everything in to maximize the amount of money they can make of the data stream that we're selling to um, the the like FanDuel to uh, and all the booking you know, all the all the, um, the the folks around the country. So 
That's someplace they're looking for about where they're going to make more revenue from. Baseball's trying to figure this out. Baseball's doing exactly the same thing with uh, that the, the, the football is doing. Okay, there's a downstream that goes out. And unfortunately, they did something last year that hurt them. They, I don't think they realized it. So I joined the pitch clock, they cut down the window and the amount of time you can do on, on individual uh, prop bets. So, if, you know, it's not 15 seconds because it still takes two seconds for it to travel from one place to another. So it's not, it's not as instantaneous as you think it is. So, all right. so where do I see the, the, the future of this going to? Expansion in baseball is probably coming. As a matter of fact, if you look at the way that the new schedule came out last year, you play every team in your league three times, or in the other league, three times, for a total of um, three, three, uh, 16, 48 games there. You play everybody in your league six times, and you play everybody in your division, I believe it is 14 times, you come up with a wonderful number of 162 games. I wonder how that's going to go so fast. So they, I think this is all part of that, you know, because they're going to need to find more revenue, because they, everyone is stacked with large contracts. You look at what the Padres have, and the Padres have been shoving contracts. The Braves this year have been massively interesting on how they've been trading players and taking on a bad contract here because they have a favorable contract, favorable TV, cable TV deal right now. So they're they're bringing in they brought in Evan White from the from the Mariners and they packaged him on to the White Sox, I believe. But they took on he had a, a, a five year contract that he signed before playing the game in the major leagues. Hasn't panned out well, but they're getting rid of that salary, and they got off their payroll. So it's it's a whole bunch of bookkeeping shell games that are going on right now. So I would say that our chances of getting two of these teams um, in this expansion coming in our near future is probably pretty likely. So that gives you 32 teams, which gives you 16 teams, and the map looks great on the season schedule. Who are the Diablos affiliated with? Uh, yeah, it's Mexico City is the uh, um, is sorry, brother. But I don't, I don't know. I mean, and it's also we got to figure out how the visual league works. That's another piece that goes with this too. Bro. So, yeah, let's see. And anyway, that's um, the another, another piece of it with this is the NHL and the NBA produced were able to increase when they increased for um, their um, expansion. And they had to do this very similar thing where they talked about a lot of European. And, and people from around by the world to come and play for that, which meant that drop off and tower was not significant. What have we seen happen in baseball in the last five years? The the Asian influence of coming in here, yeah. no question, Japan and Korea uh, and, and, and Central America, huge. Those things are getting the, uh, uh, just our, it's kind of a predecessor to what we're going to see. So that if we do expand, the drop off is not going to be as great as it would be. As you would think, it So, anyway, questions? Yes, sir. Close cable fee under right free agency. Uh, and, and it depends on the team. Uh, in which part, yeah, they have. Um, oh, well, I think they go not. away in free agency first. Uh, well, the, the, right now, that's the reason you see, I think, Blake Snell still out there. Yeah. And Ellinger uh, out there. Because no, there's only there's so few teams that can spend crazy money. Um, and so, you know, even even George Steinbrenner only occasionally spent against himself, bid against himself. So most of them now, there has to be actually somebody legitimately bidding against you for them to do that. This one. I've read that the Rangers are a little strapped as far as adding any free agents because of their television deal. What is their television? They are, they've taken a 20% decrease, uh, as have um, as Rangers and one of their team. Um, Rangers? No, the twins are a new deal. The twins are a one year deal. Uh, what's um, so uh, the Rangers have a lot of veteran contracts, and uh, the Rangers, believe it or not, last year the Astros had 11 games started by pitchers 30 year old and old. Okay, that was all by Justin Verlander. The Texas Rangers had 120 some odd games started by pitchers 30 year olds and old. Wow. The, the Rangers are in a much more condensed window to win that. Um, so, you know, it, 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 yeah. well, but, but, but baseball is offering, like right now, as of today, Padres and the Diamondbacks do not have local TV deals. Um, and, and it says on the website, come back soon, we'll have, we'll have details for you. They very well, well they're going to have some kind of deal. But the fact that we're catchers and catchers have already reported, and you used to do programming from San Diego, um, 
uh, BRAMs and, and, and air deck in order to get them interest to build up to the season. They ain't doing that this year. So, because it's, it's a cost without revenue. Yes, sir. Do the uh, clubs get a uh, take of the gambling going on, annual, all that sort of I think it goes to Major League Baseball, and I think Major League Baseball splits that up. I don't know the answer to that. You don't know the actual cut? Do not know. Yes, sir. Uh, subscribe to the MLB TV. How does the five teams that Prime, uh, Amazon Prime, I guess? Uh, effect in the I think they're going to put it on Amazon Prime is where they're going to be able to get it. But I think you can only you have to be authenticated in that market. Otherwise, the outer market stuff still goes to MLB TV. I believe this house will. But I, you know, there are so few details and all this stuff right now. I, I checked today before I came to make sure I kind of have the latest information for you. It's garbage. Well, there will there ever be a situation where you could be anywhere in the country? And watch any game you want. Yeah, probably. I could hear being. I could be in St. Louis and pick the Astros game without just click through on some stream. I guess. I, I think you'll be able to do that at some point in time, in the not too distant future. But the problem is that they're so concerned about inner market and outer market rights. That's that's their mindset, and because they want to make sure they're maximizing the revenue. Like you're an Astros fan, the people can use. They want to get everything they can get out of here. Which makes sense. I mean, that's what that's what they're trying to do. But um, they 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 don't have a good business model. For How's the NFL do there? Aren't they all sharing the same TV? Yes. Spot? Yeah, they are. They share. There's, there's no regional TV on. You know, right. Like, yeah. So, but all the commercials are sold across the board by the two or three networks. Well, baseball would never. I guess no. The Yankees and the Royals would never agree to do that because it would cost the Yankees too much money. Well, what I think you're going to see happen is the, the Major League Baseball will probably at some point in time, like the Baseball Network, all, all the baseball rights, have a channel which you can get it on and will authenticate it to your region and you'd be able to pay for it that way. I think that's where it's going to get to, but that could be next year. Um, a lot of people who used to work with me at Fox went to work for Sinclair and now we're at MLB. Um, so MLB is trying to get their hands around this because MLB sees the revenue potential on the NBA and NHL side as well. And they can get their hand in that, which everybody's looking for new revenue. Wherever they can find a new revenue from and how they find it, that's really what they're out. Yes, sir. You, you, in addition to baseball, you, you, you spoke about some hockey and some basketball and so forth. Yes, sir. But how about the NFL? Hmm? I mean, are they that head and shoulders to bump the rest? Yes. When it comes to <laughs> the crowd. Yes, yeah. Well, the, the reason the reason being in the NFL is because the NFL has only a um, only a national project, uh, uh, national product. They have no local product. So what happens is if the Texans are playing here in Houston on one of the um, like a prime video or something like that, uh, they will sell it to a local affiliate to air it. They make sure it gets on free TV inside the marketplace if the if it is. Uh, yeah, I mean, the NFL had some issues as well. Yeah, the public had an issue, like when they put a playoff game on Peacock only. Yes. And the public couldn't see it without paying for it. Right. And the NFL sort of, you know, they give them the old gap. And so what? You know, <laughs> listen, we don't care what the public thinks. This is going to be, you know, how we, how we yeah. And they're arrogant, but and they're important to be because. You know, you know, you have a well, in, in 1976 or 77, the um, NFL did a no announcer day with the Miami and the Jets, I believe it soon was. And it was an experiment. They tried it, the experiment failed, and they moved on. You know, so, <laughs> you know, and the NFL will figure, and everybody's going to figure out a way to make more money here. The, the question is, how much of the pie are you willing to give away to give your piece of pie? One of the things about recently, the NFL did. Which brings me to the The NFL announced the Eagles are playing their opening game right. in Rio in, in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And they're still yet to mention who the opponent is. Yeah. yeah. They've only taken one team. I haven't mentioned the other team. Well, so here, here's the deal the NFL started moving to the 17 game schedule two years ago, right? <laughs> the reason they moved that is so everybody will get a neutral site game and not lose a home date. That's the reason they did that. Now that's that's a long term playoff. So you know, if you we play dominoes or, or, or we play checkers, they play chess. Okay, and that's what's happening. And and they got much bigger pieces than so.
<laughs> yes, sir. How much of the difference with the NFL is because they have the one game week or teams have the one game week versus the six nights, seven nights a week? Okay. Huge. Huge. Because whether we like it or not, and I'm an NFL fan, okay, and but the NFL is an event, whereas the, the uh, baseball is a marathon and has a different skate to it. And so the see no single event could, um, you know, once a week, you know, they have a whole media package stuff. You know, when, when I work for the radio station, on Sunday you play the game, on Monday the coaches talk, on Tuesday you had, um, you get the visiting team person on the line, on Wednesday you get the visiting coach on the line, on Thursday you could get your, it, they had it scheduled out, so they, they, they inched out the media to you just enough so you were on the track every day and you had to come to them every time of year. Well, I believe the what the Texans now and so it's not even they're not producing it is some of it is and some of it some, some of it. Yeah. Well, yeah. but the thing is they can't afford not to be a partner with their with their team because if they lose the contract with the team, they're just another yeah, you know, right? I mean that's the way KBM is with them. Uh, the Astros. Yeah. You, you have product and this is what you want to do with it. So. Yes, sir. Uh, what, I guess, uh, I subscriptions that. could you use to watch the Astros this coming season? But I think there was a change, was there not? I have cable, so I can't answer that question. Okay. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't had the FI right here. But I can tell you. Good. Uh, well, you can watch it on Direct TV. Okay. And you watch it on Fubo. Okay. Okay. So that was my question to you. How can Fubo get away with charging people fourteen dollars for a regional sports fee? I mean, isn't that just heads over everybody else, or is that the going right now? It, fourteen dollars a month. It, it, it is what the competitors are rushing to do. About fourteen a month. Now? Yeah, I think, well, the thing is, I think they're paying eight eight dollars something like that a month to them, and so the rest is their guys. Okay, basically. Okay, yeah. So yeah, Fubo is streaming. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's you can get Astro right. Okay. What's that? It's still cheaper. Trust me. It's still cheaper. <laughs> so, do, yeah. do, do the teams realize how much they're losing the fans? That's what they're trying to do. Is they're trying to try to hit to them for cutting people. They have a, a piece that's available to them. My son's thirty-one years old. Okay, he yeah. doesn't have doesn't have a cable package. Right. He, he gets it on his me. He's got a little stick on his TV. Right. He watches right. what he wants to read it online, and that's that's what they want to do. That's what they're yeah. used to doing. But the one thing about sports is sports is a combined effort to watch together. Um, and so there's some you have to do it at a certain point in time. Other other stuff it goes away. So you know if you want to see like let's um, uh, NCIS song. Okay, you can record that if you want to, or you can go see it someplace else. And you know, I'm cheap, so I have cable. I'll record it on on you know, there and we'll watch it the next day. I can do this. So, but but things are on live, and that's the reason live commercials. If you if you watch a game, you have to watch the commercials. If you watch it live, <laughs> and that's what the, the subscribers know. That's the reason the cost of the advertisers is there. That's the reason the business is still skewed that direction. So. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. I had a question. The event on network television, first flight for 19, the word NFL game. Yeah. It's been an enormous change with the elite family. Absolutely. Yeah. Because, well, there's, there's no more math. There's no more. You know, I, I think NBC used to have was the, the comedy Thursday night. You would watch things, and they used to have things on that. Right now, it's like on some of the network shows or some of the networks, you have the same franchises are on two and three nights a week on um, different varieties of the same thing. And and don't be wrong, they're still making money on it, but you know, they're making money off of us. They ain't making money off our kids. And so they're trying to be in a place where they can make money off our kids. So, yes, sir. You have a question? Yeah, I was going to ask about the Astro. Yes. You might be able to see that. This year on the yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Space City. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. Oh, uh, speaking of Space City, now the new network is is the local when it moved to AT and T, they kind of had a less of a local model as far as the supporting programming. 
Is, is that going to change anything? Is there going to be I doubt it. No, they don't confirm with me, honestly. I get, I, I'm a freelancer who goes to work games. Um, but as far as I can tell, uh, it, honestly, there's, there's very little money to be made on anything other than the ball game. That's the reason the Unair and Astros game, and there's immediately following that, there's a light, and there's the following morning and the countdown version, and there's four times, five times before the next Astros game comes on. So it's the same product. They pay for it once, they're using it five times. There is, and their Astros uh, on deck or their um, all access show is the other peripheral piece of that. So there's nothing on the air there that's not Astros driven um, or Rockets driven at that point in time. That, but what it's like on the NBA, at least the rules used to be you own the rights to the image of the NBA games until 7 p.m. the following day or 6 p.m. the following day. We don't have to pay for it yet. But if it aired it two days later, we did have to pay for it. So you have to be careful about how you know, the rights piece with all that. So what would be the differences in the Astros package financially from last year to this year, do you think? I, there's a huge difference in that the Astros right now are writing checks, which up until now, the Astros have been able to be in a fire. And most of, most of the teams are exactly the same thing. Except, oh, you know, we want you to air um, our show and our games. And we're going to give you commercials. You're going to air for us. And, and you're, yeah, you're going to air for me. And then yeah, you need to write me a check, a large check. And But, but now it's going to be like, well, I, I got to go sell this now. And, and I got to pay now the people who do this too. And I got to pay for the production truck. And I got to pay for the travel to go do this. And these people eat when they're on the road. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to keep them home and do it. I mean, I, it's, I mean, it's, it's nickels and dimes. But when you're used to getting um, paid well for it, I don't think you'll see, I, I think that will be a lot more people like us will be, will see it, but it, it won't impact what you're seeing. Anybody else? Enjoy. Thanks a lot, Bill. I'm curious where the future of Astro Broadcasts are going to be. Uh, the direct-to-consumer model, I'm really kind of curious about that. I know teams like the Cubs have already started, so I'm waiting for them to announce that. If it if it does come about, it's direct to consumer. But anyway, next presentation, our chapter secretary, Gloria, she's been waiting for months to give this presentation <laughs> over a nice little baseball book. For those of you who have uh, girls in the house, right? Our us guys can read it too. You know, right? I gave it to my great grandson for Christmas. Okay, Gloria, go ahead. Okay. A little background. This, I don't know if any of y'all have ever heard of the International Women's Baseball Center based in Peoria, Illinois, which is where the all girls, the League of Our Own People began. It was Peoria, right? All girls. And now they've got a center and they have book book clubs every other month, I think. So a few months back, well, I guess it was before Christmas, and uh, this was the book that they talked about, and it was Three Strikes Summer. And so I got on the Zoom meeting, and we talked about the book. A little background. I grew up in the 50s. I played baseball with all the kids on my block and the next block, uh, mostly boys, some girls. But I was so mad because I couldn't play Little League Baseball. My brother played, but I was better than me. <laughs> <laughs> so I grew up being really mad about Little League. Now when I go see my great-grandsons play, there's girls on the team. And I'm like, oh, well, I was born too soon. But anyway, I like this book because the main character is named Gloria, and that's my name. The author is Skylar Shrimp, S-C-H-R-E-M-P-P. -P. I went to school with Ann Shrimp, elementary, high school, and college. And I asked, actually asked the author, she knew this Ann Shrimp from the city, and she said she didn't. I have no idea if Shrimp is a common name. Anyway, yeah. this this book, well, got my report on my phone here. Uh, it says on the back of the book it's for eight to 12 year olds. I would think it would, depending on whatever, somebody's reading ability or interest in baseball, 
are interested in gutsy girls, this could be for second, third grade up to high school. I read it in a day and I loved it. Um, Gloria, Gloria, it starts out with Gloria's family in the panhandle of Oklahoma in the 1930s. And as the book begins, the man from the bank is out front. Well, the family has, has packed everything they own into the truck and they're having to leave Oklahoma because the crops weren't growing, the wind blew all the good soil away, and I don't know. So as her dad is talking to the banker out front and signing the papers to give away their house, Gloria is angry because number one, her dad's being polite to this guy that's taking their house. And number two, um, what is my phone? Um, <laughs> and uh, number two, the man from the bank has this big shiny car. So what she does, she goes down to the creek behind their house, finds the biggest rock she can find. And she plays baseball. And as um, it explains, she can throw a rock and, and, and hit a bird flying by the house. She's, she's angry because the, the boys in this little town where she lived would let her be on the team. But she practices, she's a pitcher, and she's really darn good. So she picks up this stone, and as her dad is shaking hands with the banker, she throws that stone, and it goes right through the windshield of the banker's car. And the banker said, you didn't tell me you had a boy here. He said, no, I've just got girls. Well, your son just busted my window. Get out of here. Go on. Just get you're 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 out of this house, <laughs> and it it was funny because her father knew that she had done it because he'd seen her practice her her pitching. Anyway, they wind up traveling across the country and they wind up in in California at a peach orchard, and um, <laughs> there's three rules at the orchard. No stealing products, in other words, don't take any peaches, no drunkenness or gambling, and absolutely no organizing. Well, Gloria didn't understand what that was about. She said, I'm not going to organize peaches. <laughs> but uh, there's a secret all-boys baseball team that, you know, and the kids had to work with their parents. I mean, this is the 30s, you know, in Cali you know, when I was reading this, I was thinking of the grapes of wrath and how horrible things were back then. But the, the sons of, of the peach pickers had formed a baseball team. And the next orchard over was an apricot orchard, and they had a baseball team. And they would have to dig under the fences to meet and play ball. Um, so Gloria tries to try out for the baseball team and they, they tell her, we don't want any skirts. Skirts don't play baseball. Well, turns out eventually they have to let her play because she's better than their pitcher. But um, I'll just read what it says on the back. It says, Gloria has never been the type to wait around for permission. If the boys want to let her play, she'll find a way to make them. If the people around her are keeping secrets, well, she'll have a few of her own. And if the boss men, the peach orchard, say she can't organize peaches, then by golly, she'll organize a whole ball game. Yeah. And what she does is organize the game between the peach pickers and the apricot pickers. And it turns out that they did let her pitch because she was better than their pitcher. They're winning the game by one run. It's the last inning. And uh, there's two outs. She's pitching. But it's their best batter that came to bat. And all of a sudden, he hits the ball. She jumps up and tries to catch it. But it was so hard that she fell down. 
<laughs> and she finally stood up dazed and everybody's looking at her. Turns out she caught the ball. So she she won the game. But the story is interesting because yeah, it talks about union organizing and and uh, I've been retired since 08, but the last couple of years I worked with the teachers union organizing. So union organizing interested me too. Anyway, this is just a story about this little girl with a lot of guts and and uh, <laughs> the kid that wouldn't take no for an answer. So I really liked her. Uh, now, my great grandson didn't want to read it because it's about a girl, <laughs> but he has finally gotten into it. So I recommend this if you have any kids that like to read fiction and, and so on. And another interesting book, and Joe, I guess it was around Thanksgiving, you said something about Happy Turkey Day, and then you mentioned Turkey Stars. Right. The next book club that we did after this was a book on Turkey Stars written by his granddaughter. So that was a really good book, too. But anyway, that, that's it. That's my book of words. All right. Time for the fun, Fred. Last but not least, Fred has uh, a trivia contest for everybody. And uh, there's a gift for the winner tonight. Oh. There's a gift for the winner tonight. Fred, you think? Nah, I love <laughs> No. Um, all of you can work in teams or you can do this individually. It's up to you all. So, uh, Chris is going to read the questions for those of you online. And, uh, I can go ahead and I can go ahead and read it. Oh, there's two pages. I printed them front and back. Front and back. Worry about space. Okay. Now, I could have done, I could have done just the plain old everybody goes in and who knows what stats and stuff everybody did and all that kind of stuff. But I wanted to change it up a little. Mike McCroskey was so scared he didn't show up. Notice that, right? Now, is this a PhD level or a this, level? this quiz, this quiz will have some that are elementary level, some that are high school, some that are college, and some of them you're going to have to stretch farther than you've ever stressed in your life. I will be honest with you. I could not answer every single point on this legitimately myself. And the main one is the last question. Okay. I haven't seen it. Oh, I'll show it here. All right. So some of them are going to be nothing too good. This is all nicknames. Nickname. Nicknames. All right. Do you want to let everybody? Let's see what they can answer first, or do we want to? Well, let's just give them a couple of minutes yeah. and uh, peruse. If you want to read through them first, so we got uh, a couple people online doing this too. So, let me just... oh, oh, okay, I didn't see her. You got what three people online, right? Yeah, yeah. Sure. you want to read them, or you want me to read them? I'll read them out here. The uh, okay, the first question, which is a no brainer. Who was known as the Commerce Comet? Okay. Number two, who was known as Joey Bats? Okay. Are these baseball players or gangsters? These are all <laughs> baseball players. These are all legitimate, too. Who was known as No Neck? And Mike McCroskey is not the correct answer. <laughs> I will tell you that right now. Easy one. Who was known as Oil Can? Who was known as Sorilla? I love this. 
Who was known as Big Dom? Greg, you better get that. <laughs> Who was known as Prom? Here's one for Bob. Who was known as the Secretary of Defense? If you flunk, if you miss this question, you'll be asked to lead a sprint. <laughs> Who was known as the Toy Cannon? Who was known as the Flying Hawaiian? Who was known as King Felix? Who was the Penguin? Who was the Millville Meteor? I love this. Who is known as Scrabble? Who is known as the Human Rain Delight? Again, not Mike McCroskey. <laughs> he is not the answer to that question either. Who is known as the Kung Fu Panda? Easy, right, Bobby? Yeah. This, this one is real tough. We'll see what you're made of. Who was known as Tony Plush? If you know it, that's great. Who was known as Thor? This player had two nicknames, The Machine and Sir Albert. There were two players that had the same nickname, I charge. Who were they? Heard me mention both of them in here at one time or another, by the way. Again, this one, if you don't get at least one of the two, out. <laughs> Who was known as the Red Rooster? All right. This is spun off of a, a from Joe Thompson of a deal. There are several what? players whose nickname ended in Rod. Okay. Little Elvis. So there was A Rod, E Rod, I Rod, J Rod, and K Rod. And the super bonus question, which no one hit completely. George Herman Ruth had more nicknames than any player in history. There are 19 documented different <laughs> nicknames. 19 of them. I had heard of about slightly under a half. So, but it's documented. That's a point of peace, though, for all of us to get them. I don't know why I need me to go back to the page. Let me know. Yeah. No. I'm sorry, I got all my names. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 
bridges. Let's see. Thank you. It's an interesting. Yes. I saw her getting into it. I said, you know, I had to flip through it. I thought, oh, this. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I'm to start. Mm -hmm. But uh, was it suitable? Huh? Was it suitable? Any it's, it's, it's a challenge. <laughs> Oh, yeah, for me. What I'll you, wait another couple of years before I win. What do you think the winning score will be? What do you got? 47? Uh, this group? 25. 25? John got uh, probably 35. I'm kind of losing. Is this low score wins like golf or something? I don't know. Marsh is done already. Right, so she got forty. She got forty-seven. She she took my answer. <laughs> oh, you good? I made you get on. Forty-seven. I don't know if Vince can hear me. You got 47? No, 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 definitely don't. No, I'm, I'm struggling to think of some Babe Ruth nicknames. I just was going through the Sandlot lines over and over. Yeah. How about you, Sam? Wait, is each name one point? Yes. Yeah. I think I have uh, 23 total points. <laughs> See? There we go. We've got some players. I did get T plush though. Yeah, that's a stud. Yeah. 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 I tell him Frosty was scared. That's why he didn't show us. Yeah. I'm going to. At the next meeting that shows up, Ash, I'll say, man, everybody got about 44, 45, right? Let's see how you do this. Right. <laughs> Everybody throwing up their hands, or is it still? Well, we can work as team. Good evening. 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 Good Correct. <laughs> Who was known as Nonak? That's correct. Who's Jeff? Nonak Williams. Who was known as Oil Can? Dennis That's right. Who was known as Zorilla? Al Zorilla. Zorilla. Ben Zobras. Ben Zobras is correct. Somebody better get this right. Who was known as Big Donkey? Adam Dunn. That's correct. Hey, Who was Milo, up? Milo used to call. Huh? Milo used to call. Yeah. <laughs> Who was known as Prom? Travis Hafner. That's correct. Who? Who? Travis Hafner. Yeah. 
Adventure. Very good. <laughs> Bob, who was the Secretary of Defense? Who was the Secretary? No. no. Gary Close, but no. Gary Maddox. Gary Maddox. Gary Maddox, Philadelphia. Here's the one that costs you your membership if you blow it. The toy cannon. Jose Altuve. Jose Altuve. Turn your Who is known as the Flying Hawaiian? Very good, very good. And the easy one, who was King Felix? Felix Richard. Correct. Another easy one, who was the Penguin? Correct. And who was the Melville Meteor? Mike Trout. Yes, sir. Now we're going to separate the girls from the boys. Who was known as Scrabble? The guy Scrabble would go to the water. No, actually, no. That is also a lot. Really? No. Oh, it's a good fish. Mark Ripchinsky. Oh, What's the first letters? R. R. I saw that. R. C. E. P. C. Z. Y. N. S. K. I. Be in another question. I'll tell you that. Who was known as the human rain delay? Correct. Mike Hargrove. Was that it yeah, was known as the Kung Fu Panda. Pablo Snow. Correct. Here's another college level question. We've been told he's got it. Who was known as Tony Plush? Who? Niger Morgan. Correct. Niger Morgan. Niger Morgan. Yep. Let's be a brewer. He was. Brewer's <laughs> playoff hero. <laughs> Easy one. Who was Thor? Correct. Can you spell that? Oh, yes. All right. Another another grammar school. Who was known as the Machine and as Sir Albert? Correct. Who was? Who were the two players who carried the nicknames I Chart? Doug Goosh. Doug Goosh is one correct answer. Craig Smallstorm? No. Mark Rezolonic. Mark Bill Grabarkowitz. Bill Grabarkowitz. From the 70s, from the Dodgers. Doug Goosh and I played Little League ball together. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's why I said, you look at his name, you think it's Goodsy. Yeah. You know, so. All right, here's another one. Half of you cost your membership. Who were the two players known as Red Rooster? That's one. Who was the other? Rich. Rusty Staub had that nickname in Houston before Doug did, but um, Rusty didn't like it, so they took it away and they gave it to Doug, so. That's the young guy. See, that's that's great. the young guy right there. That's you tell him, Samuel. It's Tom White, reincarnated. And California. Rick Burleson. Rick Burleson. All right, now we're on to the Rod. Who was A Rod? Who was E Rod? Correct. Who was I Rod? Who was J Rod? Correct. Who was K Rod? You figure, how the hell did he get K, right? <laughs> He was a pitcher strikeouts. Yeah. All right, the super duper bonus question. This was fun. So George Herman Ruth had several nicknames. Name one. Baby. 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 Correct. Baby. 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 Correct. Baby. Correct. Baby. Correct. Baby. Yes. Baby. Yes. The big fella. Right. Rock Bomber. Yes. King, King of Crush. Or King of Crash? Correct. King, King of Crash. That's correct. Is it Bambino or Grand Bambino? 
Well, Great Bambino, but a lot of them call it Bambino or Great Bambino. I'll give you credit for either one. <laughs> well, Bambi. <laughs> actually, actually, you're close. Big Bam. Big Bam. Big Bam, Big Bam is one of his big names. Anybody else got any others? Some of these I had never heard, but they're they're documented. So, uh, did, did anyone say King of Swing? That was one of them. The Titan of Terror. A Jidge. J I D G E. That was a play on George. Herman the Great. No. This one I did hear. Modern Beowulf. The Wazir of Wham. The Maharaja of Mash. The Raja of Rap. Blunderbuss. That was a big gun. The Wally of Wallop. The Wizard of Whack. The Prince of Pounders. And the behemoth of bust. All all my team. I can't yeah. be good with no bring him up the shirt. Yeah, I don't know. So how many of you had 45 or more correct? <laughs> Besides Chris. I have no idea how many of you had. All right. So what? All right, how many had 10? All right, 15. 20. How many we got? Any of you guys got over 20 in there? Sam, you still got, you had 23, right? <laughs> no. no, I didn't get that many right. I saw okay. Vance? I had 20 total. 20 total. Ooh. How many did you have, Phil? 22? I think we have a winner. Hey, hey. Congratulations, Phil. You get to uh, do next time. Yeah. Right, next time. Next time. Do you also get a copy of uh, Carly's Wright Robinson's The Right Side of History? All right. She talked about it last month. <laughs> All right, everyone. Uh, I'm taking one month off. And Bob is Bob is running the uh, Bob is running the meeting next month. Um, I'll be here, but uh, considering my travel, golf running, uh, we'll have a great presentation. We're working on a surprise, so do not miss it. And I'm not talking about Phil's trivia contest. <laughs> What's that? What happened to uh, West? Still around. Huh? I can't hear you. Everybody have a great month. Talk to you later. Check. I can't hear you. What? Next meeting is March 18th.